at DevOps Belgium 2018, and I'm joined by the good Dr. Venkat Supermanium. Hello, welcome, thank good. you for joining. Thank you, good always to talk to you, Mark. It's always good to see you, and uh, you know, you're, you're a regular on the DevOps circuit and the Vox circuit as well. We see you around a lot of places. Um, I know you're doing a keynote this week, which is fantastic, called Spearheading the Future of Programming. So can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, programming is, is uh, something that I'm absolutely passionate about. Uh, in all honesty, I had a really hard time learning to program way back in time. And um, in a lot of ways, uh, to me, programming, learning to program is like learning music. You, you don't learn it by listening. You, you learn it by making really, really bad music. <laughs> and, and, and you have to fail in order to, to get you, better. You, and, and torture other people around you to a great extent, I would, I would suppose. And then once I got the hang of programming, um, honestly, it, I never thought I would be as excited as I am in programming because it, it really drew me in. And uh, I programmed in one language for a very long time, like a lot of other people do. And then when I learned a second language, uh, it just blew my mind because I was able to see constructs in there that I was not exposed to. And, and that immediately excited me to say, whoa, if this is what I find in a second language, imagine what I would find in a third or the fourth or the fifth. And so that really made it a passion for me to explore languages. And, and what I'm seeing today is Java development, development in Java has been by far the best in the past, I would say four or five years compared to past 20 years. And I'm going to put my money on this. The development in the space of Java is going to be biggest in the next three to four years than we have ever seen in my opinion. Why do you think that is? And, and, and part of the reason is we are living in a different world. Um, we're, not, we're no longer living in the days of where you dial up a modem and connect to the internet. Uh, we are dealing with uh, systems that are ubiquitous, always connected, there's big data. The type of problems we are solving and the type of demands that business places on us is very different compared to what we did 15, 20 years ago. Th this is a paradigm shift, not just in programming, it's a paradigm shift in the business world we live in. And, and to navigate the terrain we are in today, we need a different kind of vehicle. And, and one way to do that is to go get a completely brand new vehicle or refurbish the one we have to be able to do it. And in that regard, I would think that Java is doing the right thing, learning from other languages and, and moving us in the right direction. And you say, part of your keynote is saying that look, the kind of software industry is embryonic in so many ways in terms of the amount of time that it's taken. Yeah. And yet it's moved quite fast. And a lot of people say, oh my God, we've moved so fast and we've achieved so much. But at the same point, there are elements that haven't really moved that, that, that far at all. Absolutely, no, that, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the fun part of this. You know, if you look at one angle, we are so far ahead. And just turn around and look at another place and you're like, gosh, this is like what we were doing 50, you know, 60 years ago. Um, you know, a lot of times when I, when I look at uh, the, the growth in our field, um, it almost takes a generation for the change to happen. Uh, and this is, I'm, I'm not blaming this on people, this is, we are humans and humans are very capable, we are very creative, but yet we cling on to that comfort zone. Mm. And in a way, uh, a really good change happens every 10 years or so, and there's a reason for it, because every 10 years is a new generation. And, and, and it's just absolutely phenomenal to see a new wave of young developer come in and, developers come in and say, oh, why are you doing this? And, and they are willing to really try different ideas and, and then they enter into their comfort zone until the next wave comes and you know, shifts them ahead. And, and so this kind of disruption has to happen in the field for the field to improve. And, and I think that's what we are really seeing Part of, that, part of it is the business is moving us, the other part is the young generation of developers are moving us as well, and, and, and I think that that's, that's really a good combination overall to be in. So Java is evolving in the right way? Um, most part, yes, I would say. Um, if you really think about you know, what is wrong with Java, you know, to put it negatively in a way, um, well, what is good in Java is, Java has been the language that has survived the longest if you look at all the languages that's been around so far, right? Um, but 
At the same time, uh, the Java 8 was probably the biggest change to Java, and, and, and I, was, I always say Java was on deathbed, and, and Java 8 made the difference for it. And now it's jogging out on the lawn and it's having a good time. <laughs> and, and, and that's definitely the remarkable change, but this also, I think, gave uh, everyone involved with Java uh, a renewed interest in seeing, wow, if this is what Java 8 can do, imagine what we can do by keeping up with these changes. So, so in that regard, I would argue that Java is moving in the right direction. Um, if, you, if you look at what we've been doing predominantly in Java, I would say we've been doing imperative style of programming plus object-oriented style of programming. With Java 8, we have one more thing we add to it. We can do imperative, functional, and object-oriented. Now, functional has been on for a very long time, so people often ask the question, is functional programming going to be the next big thing? And, and I don't say yes to this question. And the reason I don't say that is, I truly believe the next big thing, several things, but one of them is reactive programming. And I think, I, I define reactive programming as functional programming plus plus. And the reason I define it that way is, it, it took me a while to realize that reactive programming is where you start with function composition and you do lazy evaluation. And, and, and this is the, fundamental of functional programming is, is laziness plus function composition. And you're building on top of that with a greater abstraction. And if you look around the world we are living in, so many libraries and so many frameworks are turning reactive. And there's a really good reason for it because this is a nice logical transition. Uh, Spring 5 has a lot of components related to reactiveness. There are so many libraries, Akka and RxJava and Vertex and so on a lot of toolkits, and, and databases are, rather than returning a record set, are returning publishers today. And as a result, we are moving in this direction of reactiveness, and, and I find, I feel, that reactiveness is actually an application of functional programming. That, that's the way I see it, and, and that excites me because you are not talking about a concept in theory but you're able to see it being applied to something useful in the, in the world we live in because we're looking at big data, we're looking at uh, you know, systems that are uh, reactive and responsive, and these tools are giving us ability to manage that complexity with the higher level of abstraction, and I, I think we're heading in the right direction in that regard. That's good to hear. Um, I'm always struck by your breadth of knowledge. You mentioned learning one language, then learning another, and then another, and you never stopped, and you kept carried on going. In an industry that's sometimes quite tribal, from software language folk here to here, I'm not going to say there can be bad blood, but there can always be some, some elements of flinging things across the fence at one another. How do you ma maintain this calmness and this, this balanced nature when you flip between um, th well, these different texts? It, it's not perfection. It's, it's definitely, I'm far from being perfect. And, and um, one of the key things I would, I would say is, um, a lot of us, as we become more mature and, and well-established, we, we actually fear failing. And, and I think, one of the key things is to openly admit that we're not perfect and we're going to fail. You know, I always say this, when, when my children were really young, uh, one, of, one of the things my wife and did really well is we both collectively agreed that when one of the kids falls down, we would never pay attention. <laughs> and and I, I'm not even kidding with you, this made a huge difference for us because the kid would go plop and fall and then we would kind of look you know, <laughs> in a peripheral eye to make sure it's not bleeding or yeah. anything and we just quietly ignore. And the kid kind of wakes up, it's like, oh my gosh, I fell down, and the face is all red and cringe. And then looks around, it's like, nobody cares. Nobody noticed. N nobody nobody cares. noticed, right? <laughs> and then gets up and then walks around. And, and then as we grow up, somehow, when we make a little slip, we feel like, oh my gosh, uh, that's embarrassing. Like, why? Uh, you know, flipping and falling down is called law of gravity. There's nothing wrong with it. And, and that's what I'm saying is, when it comes to learning to program, uh, I'm okay at failing. I'm okay at not knowing. And, uh, and, and as a result, it, it gives me that absolute desire to really learn how things are different. And, and when people say it's frustrating, 
I'm like, no, that's the fun part, right? Because I'm sitting there in the middle of the night trying to make this code work, and I feel like a kid in a candy store because this is like, whoa, it changes the way I'm thinking about it. And I think that's, that's one of the things that, that is important, I think, is because when you then come back to program in your own language that you are predominantly programming, you don't think about it the same way. You approach it very differently. I'll, I'll share with you one thing that, uh, that intrigued me. This was on NPR, National Public Radio, and they were quoting a research study, and, and this just blew my mind. They were uh, studying children, very small children, uh, who belonged to two kinds of families. Uh, one was families where parents spoke English and everybody else the, int the kid interacts with spoke, spoke English. The second group of people, the children, where parents were speaking English, but uh, they had somebody else who were speaking other languages. It may be a nanny, it could be a grandparent who is uh, you know, from abroad, it could be a friend who is a different language speaker. And then they, they, they did something which is, which is unbelievable. Uh, the person who was doing this uh, research study was sitting here, and the child was sitting right in front, and uh, the question they would ask is to the child, name the objects you see. And the children who spoke predominantly were exposed to one language would identify things they see in front of them. Like for example, if there's an object here behind me, they would identify that as well. But consistently the children who were involved in multi-language would filter out the things that the person asking the question cannot see, ah. and only show, tell things that both of them could see. Like, what's going on here? Well, this child who is exposed to multiple languages is thinking about what the other person is thinking about as well. That's interesting. And, and, and of course, we are talking about programming languages here, but that's exactly the case with programming languages too. When you get exposed to multiple different programming languages, you no longer think the same way when you go back to program in the language you code in. And, and that is the real thirst I have, is I want to be told I'm wrong. Yep. And I want to be told that there are better ways and I want to be able to realize it. And, 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 and that realization in the middle of the night, when, when something works, and then you step back and you say, whoa, I did not see that coming. And, and that spark, it's well worth it in my opinion. Venkat, I love your spark always. <laughs> um, and thank you very much for sharing. And uh, I know that people will be watching the keynote tomorrow and also be able to watch it live around the world as well as be able to catch up on YouTube as well. So I personally am looking forward to it. Thank you, appreciate thank it. You thank you. Cheers. <laughs>